thank you all for coming, and I appreciate you giving me a chunk of your Saturday. Um, and I, I hope that uh, I'll get you some information that's uh, worthwhile and will maybe help you to think about Ithaca in a slightly different way. Um, I, uh, as uh, an archaeologist who works on native sites, working at Cornell, uh, most of my research is in the Geneva area, but I certainly, I grew up in Trumansburg, and I'm very interested in, uh, um, I live in Trumansburg now, and uh, uh, I'm very interested in, in this particular locality. And it's always struck me that there's almost nothing that's uh, comprehensive, up-to-date, uh, about the Indian presence in Ithaca. And so I've always had it in the back of my head that I want to just sort of keep thinking about that and, and with the idea that maybe I would just collect information over time and that uh, uh, sooner or later I'd be able to write something about that. And really, uh, so I have been collecting information and I'm going to continue to do so. I think what I'm going to present today is really very much a work in progress. It's not the final word. And uh, what I think I will show you is that there can't be a final word. Um, and what I found over time was that there were little bits and pieces uh, and that you could often find out more if you sort of followed up the loose ends, chased down uh, the paper trail associated with uh, certain references, certain artifacts, certain sites, but that almost all of it ended up in sort of a frustrating dead end um, uh, at, at sooner or later. And I'm going to give you I'm going to tell you a lot of stories about some of these uh, discoveries and where I got to and uh, sort of where I reached dead ends. Uh, but I, uh, and so I haven't really been able to produce that discussion of, the, of Indian history in, uh, in Ithaca because of these dead ends. The information is not of a quality that archaeologists tend to use. Uh, we tend to focus very much on context-rich sort of environments. So we need to not only know about the artifacts, we need to know exactly where they were found. Not just in Ithaca, not just on the Cornell campus, but you know, preferably to the square inch where they were found. We need to know where, what they were found with. Um, and uh, we need to be able to examine the artifacts uh, we need to have copious notes about where the artifacts were found, who found them, uh, uh, you know, what sort of techniques were they using? Were they just walking along through a plow field and pick something up, or were they were they excavating? And when you look at what's gone on in Ithaca, there are some notable exceptions. And uh, one of the uh, one of the directors of the exceptions is sitting in the audience. So I don't. I have to make sure that I single out Shereen for doing good work uh, within the with, you know within the boundaries of the city of Ithaca. But almost everything else that I'm going to be talking about is uh, uh, is, is missing really crucial pieces. Uh, so this has been really an exercise in frustration for me as an academic. And then what, at a certain point, what I realized was that the story was not about assembling a comprehensive account of the Indian past in Ithaca, but the story was the frustrations and the missing pieces and what's been destroyed, forgotten, and never noted about uh, the indigenous past in this particular area. So really, I'm going to try and concentrate as much as I can I'm within the boundaries of the city of Ithaca. A few times, I have to sort of extend my reach. Um, you know, if you if you sort of have a flexible idea of where where you what you want to talk about, I can give sort of uh, uh, an account of what archaeologists believe that Indian people were doing in the past over the centuries and millennia. Uh, that is possible to do it uh, if you sort of say, OK, if we've got a site near Syracuse, a good site near Syracuse, that's great. Another one over near Watkins Glen, Lamoka Lake, uh, Geneva. If you sort of extend your boundaries and, uh, and pick the good examples, you can definitely get a pretty good account. But as soon as you start to limit it and we want to say, we want to, I want to know about what was going on here, right here. Uh, then, uh, then it becomes much less, uh, uh, much less feasible, and I'll, you know we'll see this all as we uh, uh, as we move along through the talk. Of course, uh, we are in uh, the traditional homelands of the Haudenosaunee uh, or Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy, and we are uh, within the traditional uh, uh, territories of the Cayuga Nation uh, uh, right here. Um, and uh, uh, this is certainly a very important part of the story. Uh, the Cubas still have a relationship to this area. They, even though they were uh, uh, driven out of it, uh, they're trying to reestablish themselves. 
uh, uh, at the north end of the lake today, but this is very much uh, Cayuga territory. If you talk to Cayuga people, they're still very concerned about what's going on here, uh, about the way that land is used, about uh, res how resources are used. Uh, as someone from Cornell, I get reprimanded for the Lake Source Cooling Project most every time that I see a uh, Cayuga person. So this is, uh, they're still uh, very uh, um, uh, keyed in uh, to what's going on here, uh, and, they, and, they, uh, and they have a proprietary interest in what's happening here, even though legally uh, this is no longer uh, a Cayuga territory. Of course, um, most of you uh, realize that, uh, that there are no um, official, officially recognized uh, reservations in the Finger Lakes region today. Uh, the Cayugas uh, were, were pushed out entirely uh, from this area by New York State in particular. Uh, the federal government didn't help much, but uh, New York State is the primary uh, sort of ejecting agent, I would say. Uh, and so Cayugas today um, uh, live, uh, there are many, uh, probably the biggest, oops, excuse me, the biggest uh, contingent of uh, Cayugas now lives in what's called the Six Nations Reserve. Uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Ontario, just west of Niagara Falls. There are also numerous Cayuga people uh, living on Seneca Reservation, particularly uh, Cataraugus and Tonawanda uh, in western New York, and there are also uh, Cayugas in Oklahoma, where they were moved uh, as a process, as part of the, uh, the Indian removal efforts of the federal government uh, starting in the 1830s. Some Senecas and Cayugas uh, ended up all the way uh, in Oklahoma. And my, uh, my, uh, my colleague, John Parmenter, called their uh, tribal offices, and they have southern accents, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, sort of an interesting thing to think about. But we also have to think about, really, the scale of the dispossession and the amount of effort that it's taken to us to be able to maintain their connection to this area when uh, settlers uh, um, like me have, uh, have uh, um, uh, spent so much time and energy really trying to keep uh, them out. What I do there? Um, okay, so it's, what I'm going to be offering today is an archaeological perspective. I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the tangible artifacts, sites, um, locations. Uh, archaeology is very good at certainly thinking about what people were doing in certain locations. It's especially good about thinking about things like uh, subsistence. What were people eating? What were they growing? What were they gathering? What were they fishing? What were they... Uh, trapping and hunting, uh, what was their technology like, what was their architecture like, how did they structure their communities, uh, what, wh where did they place those communities in relation to things like lakes and uh, bodies of water, swamps, that sort of thing. So uh, I'm definitely, you can see my perspective here. And what I, what I realized is that the way that I approach this is very much like an archaeologist is we want to see something definite before we can really sort of take it as being for real, okay? So in other words, uh, uh, that, that I was uh, uh, frustrated uh, by sort of thinking about the Ithaca area because there's so little that you can really sort of, as an archaeologist, sink your teeth into. Uh, there's so little preserved evidence, uh, either in documentary or archaeological collections. Uh, and so um, um, I would contrast this, however, with, excuse me, uh, an indigenous perspective that there have been times where I've sort of been able to discover where there are known sites, and I've told this to some of my indigenous colleagues, and also, uh, in particular, Cayugas, uh, who, who I visited, um, who have visited at the guy, was saying, you know, we've got a definite site, you know, on North Geneva Street, um, you know, and, and so, and, and I've been really excited about that because we have a data point, we have something where that an archaeologist, uh, someone of my scholarly persuasion, can sink their teeth into. And they've, uh, you know, I was like, I can show it to you. You know, I can walk you over there. I know where it is. You know, and this is a, a big development for me. And they've been primarily uninterested in this, uh, in this. And I think what we, uh, um, what I've grown to gather is they don't need the data points. Uh, that this is their land, and they don't, you know, they, 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 I think that they're probably like, of course, there's a site over there. You know, you stupid white guy. You know, there's sites everywhere. The whole area is a site, and I think probably if we had surveyed this uh, archaeologically just to, you know, very thoroughly and sort of said, where are there stone tools? Where are there places where people camp? Where are the places where people fish, where they travel? That, yeah, this whole, this whole area was a site, you know, that there, there's no question. I, you know, right here, uh, this was definitely a site, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's gone now, and that's, that's really uh, one of the things I'll be 
uh, uh, you, know, you know, we'll talk about uh, extensively here today. But uh, this is, I think we, uh, um, I, and uh, the more I look, the data points that I am satisfied with are few and far between, but there are little hints that, uh, that there was extensive uh, uh, Indian settlement, uh, you know, relatively dense populations uh, in Ithaca over time. Not consistently so, but sort of going up and going down. And I think I'm really sort of coming around to this, uh, uh, th this way of thinking more than my own disciplinary training where we actually have to sort of, if we're thinking about Ithaca, we have to accept that there was a ton, there was a ton of, uh, of Indian activity here in the past. Uh, and and uh, uh, even though we were not really going to be able to know uh, the specifics about it. What my project has involved is really, it's about paper, uh, the paper trail for various uh, sites and artifacts uh, and collections. So I have not done any excavation uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Ithaca area, or in fact in Cayuga territory overall. Uh, that's something I would need to work out with the Cayugas. Uh, and, and I haven't done that. Uh, uh, I haven't obtained their permission uh, to work in this, uh, to, to sort of dig new things. Uh, but I have sort of looked at the paper trail and uh, artifact collections and that sort of thing. And basically what I do is I will find a reference, and I've been collecting them over the 20 years that I've been doing this sort of thing. Uh, whenever I re I'm reading sort of a general source, and they'll say, ah, this artifact was found by the Cornell campus. I'll make a note of it, and then uh, I'll try and uh, try and fo uh, follow whatever leads I have. So, in other words, if it was, if these artifacts were described uh, by someone at the Smithsonian, and they have pictures that were taken at the Smithsonian, I've written to the Smithsonian and sort of said, "What kind of information do you have on this?" Um, occasionally, you'll see uh, information, and I guess uh, many of you are probably aware of this book. Uh, called Old Indian Trails uh, in Tompkins County that was written by Glenn Norris, who was the Tompkins County historian. Uh, the first edition was 1944, and he revised it in 1969. And he has uh, sort of, the part that I am most interested in is he sort of goes through the various towns uh, in, uh, in Tompkins County. He's got a chapter in the very back called Early Man in Tompkins County. Uh, uh, but there were women too and children. Um, so, but uh, but he sort of goes through on a town by town basis. So in other words, he's got a few paragraphs about Caroline, a uh, few a uh, few paragraphs on Newfield, et cetera, et cetera. And he he uh, it seems like he was pretty much doing the same thing. He was catching little references here and there. And uh, uh, most of his references in there are pretty unsatisfying because he wasn't an archaeologist, and so. There are a lot of things where he'll say that there was a site there, and he won't say what was found there, so I don't know how old it was. But occasionally he gives sort of a little bit of information that says, uh, that indicates where he found that information. So uh, this is a really good starting point for me and probably for you as well. And you can sort of follow these paper trails, um, and you can go into various different archives. There's some great stuff uh, in the archives here. Uh, there's some in the Cornell Library. Um, you know, I've been dealing with the National Anthropological Archives in Washington, and so you just sort of follow that paper trail and see where you can get to. You sleuth it out, right? Um, uh, uh, and that's, that can be kind of fun, uh, uh, and it also can be kind of, uh, kind of frustrating. And this is uh, Norris's map from the 1969 edition where he has the location of, uh, of some, uh, some uh, where he thought some uh, indigenous sites were located, and some of those I agree with and some of them not. Uh, what's kind of unfortunate about this is that he's got a lot more sites on that map than he documented in this publication. Uh, and as far as I know, he never, he doesn't have uh, a collection of notes. Uh, so in other words, he doesn't have his notebooks where he was writing things down. He doesn't have anything where he said, this is, this is my annotation for how I produced this map. Uh, so and I believe me, I tried to find it, and uh, apparently he didn't. He didn't do that, or they weren't preserved. Um, so uh, you know that that's the sort of thing you just want to go back and really uh, follow the paper trail, uh, go and find the artifacts. A lot of times, if you go to uh, an institution where they hold Indian artifacts, they'll have acquisition records, display records, conservation records, and there's often some specific information on those things. You know, even you know just when it came in to the museum uh, uh, that, you won't, that you'll ne you won't find anyplace else. So you just have to sort of kind of doggedly uh, follow these things out. Definitely a work in progress. 
Um, even sort of looking around here today, I took a fresh look at some of the lithographs on the walls and some of the early maps in the map room back there. Uh, and, uh, and after sort of uh, preparing this presentation, I went in there and I looked and I was like, oh, that's where the McGraw House was that they were talking about in 1895. Uh, or you can see over there that, uh, the, that the grading for Seneca Street had been completed in 1836 based on that lithograph right there. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, there's certainly a lot uh, here. And I'm going to sort of summarize where I am with some of these specific examples. Um, uh, I don't study early settlers in Ithaca, uh, the American settlers, and there may be some of you out there who know this a lot better if you sort of say, well, dummy, you know, this is, uh, this is what they're referring to. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of leave some of these as open books, and you know, it's something if you feel like uh, pursuing these, uh, um, uh, you know, definitely, uh, definitely fill me in if you get if you get far enough. Uh, those of you who know, uh, um, uh, some of you may know about sites or collections that I'm unaware of, um, uh, and certainly uh, I'd be happy to uh, uh, to hear your uh, your accounts. And as I said, this is really going to be less uh, sort of, uh, you know, this is what happened, then this happened, then this happened, than it is going to be sort of a series of stories, which uh, is not the way I usually present things. I'm much more sort of uh, this, that, and then that type of, uh, type of guy. Um, just to give you a very, very brief introduction, and I, can, and I could speak sort of, you know, about if we, if we talk more about the region, uh, about what uh, indigenous peoples were doing over, over time. Uh, um, uh, this is sort of the standard periodization. It's not, not everybody loves it, but I still think it's, uh, it, it's a useful way to sort of think about the long-term scope of the indigenous past. Uh, that we start, uh, we have these sort of period names, uh, and we start the earliest sites uh, um, uh, and artifacts that are known from this part of the world are um, you know, just about 13 and a half thousand years old. Um, this was during the time when the, at the tail end of the last ice age, and it seems like people came in here pretty soon after the, uh, after the glaciers had retreated. And there are some very distinctive forms of material culture uh, associated with each of these periods. Uh, uh, but we have in this uh, very long stretch, so we've got you know, a good 9,000 years, uh, we basically have people hunting, uh, hunting, gathering, and fishing. Uh, they're not producing their own food. The only domesticated animal that they're using is the dog, uh, um, you know, for hunting and, uh, um, and companionship purposes, probably. And we see pretty dramatic ecological changes. You get the, the Ice Age retreats, and then uh, if you sort of think about, um, you know, uh, um, it's, it's a little bit like global warming, I guess. So, you know, now as we can sort of look out and sort of say North Carolina is coming in, you know, a few decades here, uh, that's what you started to see is that you had sort of a tundra taiga environment, then you had a coniferous forest, and then eventually in the late archaic period you had a deciduous forest. And certainly it seems like the population densities go up generally uh, over time, uh, and there were definitely a lot of people living here in the late archaic. It's a very common uh, type of uh, type of site to find in this, in this particular area. We then start to get the development of some durable cooking technologies. They certainly had, you know, they were certainly cooking and uh, um, probably doing a lot of stuff with stone boiling and baskets or hide containers in the earlier periods. But here we start to see the development of things that people would, you know, carry around. Pots made either out of, out of stone or out of ceramic. Um, it probably is associated with staying in one place a little bit longer uh, than the earlier folks did. Uh, those of you who have moved, uh, you know that moving your plates is sort of the one of the worst parts of it. And books too, you know, don't tell me about books. But, uh, but you know, moving plates and, and pots is not something that you want to do uh, all that frequently. So uh, we've got a few different kinds. Uh, again, they're diagnostic of certain time periods. Um, we also see quite a bit of long distance exchange. Uh, there's some. Uh, with mound building uh, takes place in this particular er area, uh, excuse me, era, um, and that's certainly something that the, uh, that the early accounts, uh, when you had Indian mounds, that was something where uh, the settlers, the early settlers, really uh, wrote that down uh, quite commonly. And what you start to see, uh, in, especially in the early woodland and the middle woodland period, is you start to see limited use of cultivants, things like Squash was the first one, then you get the introduction of maize, uh, and then uh, actually not even in this time period, at least archaeologically, it seems that beans came quite a bit, uh, quite a bit later. Uh, you also get the uh, introduction of ceramic and stone smoking pipes in the early woodland period. 
Um, so there's, you know, there's quite a bit of technological change. It looks like people are probably uh, settling down a little bit more sedentary than they, uh, than they were earlier. Yes? Could you just mention what the mounds are very briefly? Yes, the mounds are, um, were often, um, most of the mounded constructions were used for burials um, in, uh, in this area. And uh, um, uh, well, let's just, since we're talking about this area, uh, most of the time Indian, Indian mounds were burials. Some of them were constructed uh, you know, out of whole cloth by people bringing in rocks and soil and, and various different things. And other times uh, Indian people would use glacially produced natural features uh, to bury their dead. Um, and uh, uh, you know, that their drumlins, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the Indian mounds, I think uh, the early settlers in particular were very interested in burial areas. Um, uh, uh, and dug them up uh, and destroyed them left, right, and center. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that, that was uh, one of the most obvious places to find uh, Indian relics would be in these, uh, in these various different mounds. And, uh, and uh, the, most of them are pretty well gone from this region. But there's sort of a very limited period in time when that, uh, when that actually takes place. And there are a number of accounts, I think there are a lot of local stories where they, where they see anything that's a mound and say it's an Indian mound. There are a few in Perry City that I think are just, you know, they're drumlets. You know, we don't have any indication uh, that there was, uh, that, there, that, uh, that Indian people, I'm sure they used it, but, uh, but as far as being sites or burial areas or human constructed, that's probably not, uh, probably not the case. Thanks. Is that, is that good enough? Okay, thanks. When we get to um, the, 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 what's known as the late woodland period, uh, you start to see all the elements that we recognize as Haudenosaunee uh, culture, things like longhouses, use of the, of the three sisters, nucleated communities, uh, certain forms of material culture. That really all comes together in the late woodland period. I think uh, some people have argued that there were migrations of native people, you know, sort of re population replacement. Uh, over time, and I think that if you look at most of the way this develops, you can see sort of a very, very gradual um, uh, uh, change from one thing to another rather than sort of an abrupt replacement. And some people have argued, um, uh, the archaeologist Dean Snow, in about that, it, that there was a massive migration from Pennsylvania in about 900, but uh, more recent research has really indicated that a lot of the pottery types that he thought showed up only after 800 or actually as much as 500 years earlier. So there's this sort of interdigitation of various different types. And I find it very, very hard to, uh, to uh, see any evidence where there was a radical break. So uh, just in terms of uh, uh, whether we're thinking about, even though there are a lot of names here, and some of you may be sort of thinking, well, it's like the Normans and the Angles and the Saxons, you know, in Britain, where you do have that sort of waves of replacement and mixture. Uh, these names are really just sort of conventions that archaeologists use, uh, and they mostly have to do with technology uh, um, uh, rather than sort of ethnicity. So I think you can certainly make the case that the same group of people, people has been here since the Ice Age times. Uh, you know, sure they were moving around and you know little local uh, local stuff, but you don't have this sort of uh, uh, big replacement one group by another. Then you start to get pesky European people on the coasts uh, around 1500, um, uh, and they, they trade with groups on the coast, uh, and European goods are introduced into the interior, including up into central New York. Uh, and, this, and, and there's definitely a fair amount of European-made material, uh, European-derived material on sites by about 1540 or 1550 in this area. And almost every European good that is introduced at that time gets made into something that looks more native, right? So this is uh, that spiral right there that probably started out its life as a brass kettle. It was then cut apart and sort of bent and uh, um, you know and and, uh, and curved and, and made into an ornament that was uh, either sewn on in clothing or may have uh, been a, a form of bound adornment in one way or another. After around 1610, you get direct engagement with European powers, and there's a pretty long period. That's actually with a period of direct engagement, as I labeled there. That's my specialization. Uh, so this other stuff, I really have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but there's this very long period where Haudenosaunee uh, where people are really very much in control of this territory, and I don't really see uh, 
uh, Europeans and Americans having uh, really the upper hand uh, in terms of uh, control of this area until 1779, which is the American Revolution and the Sullivan Clinton expedition. So that's sort of the general chronology that I'm going to use. And what I'm going to do now is go back and say, what can we find in chronological order from Ithaca? And what do we know about uh, how, it, uh, you know, how uh, uh, indigenous peoples were using this, uh, this, uh, this area around here? As I mentioned, there are a lot of older sources. Uh, that's almost all what I'm using for this particular project, um, uh, is to try and go back and sort of sleuth out some of that information from these, uh, from these older sources. Um, we, when you get back into the older sources, a lot of them have quite a few warts um, that are very obvious. Um, there are definitely some local histories that were produced by early settlers when they're talking about Indians. They had some very, very distinct ideas. They wanted to prove certain things. So, in other words, there are accounts where they say that giant skeletons were unearthed. Um, that's pretty common in central New York. And I think that people really, really wanted to tie the history of this area to the Bible, uh, to that passage in Genesis where they say that the you know, giants were on the earth. Uh, no giant skeletons, as far as I know. You know it's, it's, uh, some of this stuff was really, I think, you know, uh, wishful thinking or, or, uh, or outright fabrication. Uh, some of the stuff about Tiganic Falls, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, you know, there's a little bit too much Romeo and Juliet in some of those accounts to, for me to believe. Uh, that that has a, a completely indigenous uh, indigenous origin. So I, I need to I need to uh, uh, that's another thing to sort of uh, think about a little bit more. So you do get, and even some of the early scholars, uh, we see Arthur C. Parker, who was a noted archaeology archaeologist in the uh, uh, in the 20s and 30s, himself a Seneca, that he posited that there was an Eskimoan occupation uh, in uh, in New York State. Um, uh, as it turns out, some of those tools that he identified as being of quote unquote Eskimo origin are actually four or five thousand years old and have nothing to do with, uh, with anyone who was uh, uh, you know, of Inuit descent. Uh, here's another, another sort of example where uh, they, they identify uh, Frontenac Island, uh, uh, which is uh, in Union Springs, as an Algonquian village, even though it's uh, you know, almost 4,500 years old. That, uh, uh, that Parker and some of his colleagues thought that they knew what language was spoken there. Um, uh, you know, uh, you can't dig up language. Uh, that's a little bit too, uh, uh, too, too much, too many assumptions. Uh, so, uh, so you have to sort of filter out many of these things. And some, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, people, even like uh, like Norris. I think he, uh, he he plots the location of these Indian trails with a great deal of confidence. And I think only in one instance did he actually say, well, there's a segment of the trail where you can still see it, right? Just a very, very short bit of it. And the rest of it, I think, is just sort of, well, how do you get around in Ithaca? You know, uh, that there, there are some places where you can walk easily and other places that you can't. But as far as saying, you know, this is exactly where the trail goes, I think he was probably a, a little bit uh, too confident. And he didn't talk a lot about his methods, uh, about him sort of reconstructing the trails, which I think is also sort of uh, unfortunate. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of things. Uh, what you really, I think, have to concentrate on is the description of things that actually were found at particular sites. And sometimes you can, uh, you know, I can look at a description of an artifact, and I'll give you a couple of examples here where I can look at that description and say, oh, okay, I know exactly what that was, even though the guy in 1912 uh, didn't, uh, didn't know it, but he described it in enough detail where I can sort of reconstruct it. Some people have made the argument uh, that Tompkins County, in relation to other parts of central New York, and particularly in relation to the north end of the lake, that it was pretty sparsely populated. Um, I think there's actually a case to be made for this, um, that I don't think in Ithaca we had the population centers that we did, uh, say, in particularly in Cayuga County. Uh, that, that, that we know that historically there were some big Cayuga villages up there, probably some of those communities had 2,000 people. There are lots of them. Uh, this is a project I did with an avocational archaeologist, a long time sort of, somebody who's been looking into Cayuga sites for 40 or 50 years, Bob Diorio, and a GIS, a graduate student, excuse me, who was uh, a GIS specialist. And we sort of got a whole bunch of 
similar to the way I'm talking about today, we, were, we found a whole bunch of reported uh, site locations and sort of, that's all of them, you know, that the, this was a whole bunch of them. And you can see, although there are a few down uh, in, in the Ithaca area and, and around Hopkins County, most of the action is, uh, is really up the, up the lake a little bit. Um, that's definitely true, uh, and I think that it, in contrast, that the north end of the lake was better uh, for indigenous settlement than this area was. Part of the reason is because that's the, uh, that's the foot of the lake, that's where it drains out, sediment is built up there, it's shallower, warmer up there, it's better fishing if you're going to use nets and uh, um, you know, some of the other surface methods that, uh, that indigenous people use, it's better fishing up there than it is down here. Uh, the soils are, be are better up there. Where's Jane Mount Pleasant? She's, uh, she pointed that out uh, uh, quite, quite dramatically. And it, uh, uh, experiments and uh, soils down here are, not, are nowhere near as good as they are up, uh, up north. Uh, another very important factor up north was the Seneca River, which, uh, which has been sort of messed up by the Erie Canal and uh, uh, the Barge Canal and a lot of other canals that were dug uh, by early settlers and in some cases still uh, are used. Uh, but the, uh, the Seneca River went across the, the, north, uh, the north parts of Seneca and Cuba uh, lakes. It ended up going down, uh, connects to uh, Onondaga Lake, and eventually sort of runs out at Oswego. And that was a great east-west travel corridor. Uh, lake Ontario was probably a little risky in a canoe if you had a, you know, a, you know, that was not something that you wanted to do, but you had this entirely sheltered route uh, with, a, with a narrow river, it was great, it was safe, uh, you had plenty of places to pull over, um, uh, and, and it was used for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Very major transportation uh, corridor. Um, and then you could get, with only a short portage, you could get into the Mohawk River, uh, go down uh, go down to uh, Albany, get into the Hudson. Uh, you, could, you could go out to Niagara uh, with, o with only a few short portages as well. So it was a way of connecting really the whole northeastern uh, subcontinent. And so if you lived up north, you'd uh, be uh, closer to that superhighway, uh, you know, that indigenous superhighway. Down here, you're essentially isolated just the way we are, uh, we are now. <laughs> Of course, we have to think about site destruction as well. Um, and uh, a lot of these sites are known because they're in farm fields, and they still are. Um, and uh, sort of the more urban locations tend to have a lot more destruction. You know, this, this place right here is a, 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 very prime, a very prime example. So we have to remember that Ithaca didn't always look like this. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and there was a lot of movement of Earth. Uh, uh, that had to take place before we could end up with something that uh, looks like today. Uh, there's some great examples from maps from 1790 and 1806, and you can see based on the, uh, based on the, the, the topographic symbols that a lot of the Flats of Ithaca was a big swamp. Um, and so I think we can really, if you um, think more about what Montezuma looks like today or the area around uh, Watkins Glen, uh, where there's still quite a bit of swamp uh, there as well. Those, of course, have been modified tremendously. There's been a lot of water control efforts and some of the, uh, you know, some of the canals and that sort of thing. But there's still, you can get a better sense of what this area would have, been, would have looked like. I think down here it's been pretty well filled in. Up in the flats of Geneva, right at the top end of uh, Seneca Lake, that's been pretty well filled in. But we have to think about uh, before Europeans and Americans got here, that was swamp, right? So that this is going to be more like what the flats of Ithaca would have been like. Similarly, you also have a lot the slopes that we have here. Um, you know, we're used to sort of you know you, you go up Buffalo Street and it's nice and smooth. Well, it's actually getting nice up here. There's still a few jumps in there right, uh, uh, by the uh, by the uh, the yellow flashing light and other places. Uh, but that smoothness was not the way it was, right? There are accounts in Ithaca, early Ithaca where there were big sort of uh, banks of sand and gravel on the hills uh, that had to be removed before these route, uh, before the roads were put in. And if you look at the early maps there, there are no roads going up, uh, going up East Hill uh, just because there are a few sort of trails and, you know, uh, probably Route 79, but, what, but all the other, uh, you know, Seneca Street, Buffalo Street, all those, uh, didn't exist, and there had to be a lot of grading and filling that had to take place. So, for example, uh, the early settler Samuel Parker, who was the son of one of Ithaca's first doctors, describes a 40-foot-high bank of sand, gravel, and clay across what is now Seneca Street. 
Uh, and he says that in the, set, uh, in the 1830s, the way that settlers dealt with this was there was a spring that was even further up the hill, and they diverted it and basically used uh, the, wa the diverted water to sort of wash away that bank until they had a uh, down to grade, and they could put a road in there. And of course, there was an indigenous cemetery in there, uh, and so that was part of the things that they that they blitzed out of the way in order to put in Seneca Street was a uh, was a cemetery. Uh, top of the count. Uh, these are diagnostically quite clearly what uh, date to the Paleo Indian era. And uh, Dr. John Lothrop, who's a specialist in the Paleo Indian period at the uh, New York State Museum, dated these pictures stylistically uh, to. Um, uh, as you can see right here, we've got 11,000 BCE uh, and, and maybe 700 uh, years later or so. These are among the oldest artifacts that are found uh, in, the, in the entire state. Um, what we know about them is that they were found, uh, there was a publication by uh, the uh, New York State archaeologist, that was his official uh, physician, William Ritchie. He made a publication called Traces of Early Man in the Northeast. Uh, sorry, Bill, there were women and children as well. Uh, but uh, what he said in this chart, he published these photographs, and he, said he, uh, and he uh, wrote in his description of where the found uh, where the finds were made, he said they were found, quote, on high ground overlooking the foot of Cuba Lake on the Cornell University campus. And that's all we've got. There are a few problems there. Uh, first of all, where can you not see the lake on the Cornell campus? Um, it's an enormous campus. Uh, it would have been, you know, it, I, I think it would have been really nice to be able to say where were the oldest artifacts in the county? Where do we know that there were very, very early indigenous people up on the Cornell campus? Uh, we don't know. Okay, this is all that we have. We also have more significant problems. Can you see the foot of Cuba Lake from the Cornell campus? The foot is at the north end, right? This is the head of Cuba Lake. And so Richie had done some work at Frontenac Island. He probably knew the different, he probably knew which way the water flowed uh, from south to north. So either he screwed up and uh, should have said head or else. Now, are there parts of the Cornell University campus that, for example, you could see the foot of, uh, of uh, uh, Cuba Lake from? There are all sorts of experimental farms that are uh, run up and down. Uh, um, so, for example, um, uh, the agronomy department uh, ran experimental fields in Virgil, Aurora, Mount Pleasant, which is on the Allegheny Plateau, Marcellus, Geneva, and in the Arnott Forest. There are little pieces of Cornell land all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so Richie, I don't know whether he, there's something wrong here, right? Either it was the head of Cuba Lake and it was found, he said they were found in Tompkins County, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, either he messed up there, which would be the more minor er error, or else he didn't know about these Cornell properties in other places, and he said, oh, Cornell, it's gotta be Ithaca. And then, uh, and then he did, you know, so there's, there's something screwed up here, right? This is kind of, uh, we, you know, it may be that these aren't even from Tompkins County or from uh, Ithaca at all. Uh, they may be from Cuba County, closer to the Seneca River, uh, where there are actually quite a few points of this variety and age that are found uh, uh, further, uh, further to the north. It gets worse, unfortunately. Um, so these photographs were taken at uh, the Smithsonian by an anthropologist named Frank H.H. H. Roberts. Um, he shared them with Richie. He sent the, uh, the, the photos to him. He also sent the photos to Glenn Norris at the, what was then the DeWitt Historical Society, Society in Ithaca. Um, and uh, what we, you can sort of trace this correspondence a little bit. And uh, um, Roberts got them from a guy uh, named John P. Young, who actually donated a fair amount of stuff to the History Center, some of which is being repatriated to uh, but you know, so people, uh, as, it was as it was found in graves. Uh, and John P. Young said that, it, that you know, these were not actually even his. They were found by a Mr. Drake, who was an employee of the agronomy department. Uh, and, he met, he, and Drake found a fair number of artifacts on the department's grounds. Um, the agronomy buildings, uh, uh, over time, have included uh, Morse, Robert Stone, Caldwell, Bradfield, and Emerson Falls. 
on campus, and of course they have all these other satellite properties where they conduct experiments. So we're not really, you know, we can't narrow this down, right? Even if it was in Ithaca, there are a lot of different places that it could have been. Uh, most of them, you know, sort of up on the Agua end, of course. Um, and what eventually happened to these points is uh, they were uh, young, uh, sent them to the Smithsonian. Uh, Roberts examined them, photographed them, and sent them back. They were apparently briefly on display uh, at uh, the DeWitt County Historical Society, the ancestor of this establishment. Uh, they were called the Drake Collection, and I assume at some point Mr. Drake took them back. Um, and we don't know, we have no idea where they are right now. So uh, it's a good thing somebody took these photographs, uh, but as you can see, this is one of those frustrating stories. We don't have the artifacts, we don't have the exact location, there are errors in the paperwork uh, all over the place, and uh, you know, so this is one of those things where it may actually be a, a complete dead end. What I would do at this point is probably find the oldest living member of either the staff or the faculty of the agronomy department, ask them if they knew uh, uh, who Drake was, try and find his family, look at the personnel records and see where he worked. Uh, of course, we know that this was uh, the correspondence from Young to the Smithsonian started in 1953. We don't know whether Drake found them, uh, you know, 10 minutes before uh, Young wrote the letter or 40 years earlier, right? So that we can't go back and sort of say, well, you know, in 1953, Young was working in, uh, in Geneva at the at experiment station. We can't do that. So, you know, there's, uh, but, but that's how I do it. Um, and maybe someday I will. Or you can. <laughs> um, archaic period sites, this is a very long time period. Uh, they're typically very, very well represented in New York State. This is particularly because these were pretty mobile populations and uh, people tended to travel around. Uh, they'd stay in, you know, they'd establish main camps really seasonally. You can imagine living around here, spend the summer by the lake, uh, get up into the hills away from the wind during the winter. Um, you know, it was a very sensible way uh, to do things. And there were also a lot of things, in addition to those sort of residential base camps, there were a lot of things like places where people would go and fish, there were kill sites, there were places where they would, uh, where they would hunt, uh, um, hunt uh, you know, harvest passenger pigeons, uh, hunt deer, all that sort of stuff. So in many places in central New York, there's a pretty solid coating of archaic period stuff uh, across the landscape. Um, there's generally a pretty serious lack of uh, documented archaic uh, finds right in, um, in Ithaca itself, although I do note uh, that there is a, a, a net weight there that is from the Stewart Park area that uh, has been dated at least tentatively to the archaic period uh, in that display case over there. Uh, but I think this is probably for lack of trial. It's just because people didn't do this uh, particularly diligently. We do have a few whips of archaic period occupation. Um, in 1874, there was a young, uh, budding anthropologist who I think was only 16 at the time, named Frank Hamilton Cushing. Those of you who are anthropologists will recognize that name. Uh, but he came to Ithaca. He sort of secured basically an internship uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the University Museum, which was in McGraw Hall uh, at the time. Uh, that was being directed by Charles F. Hart, who was a geologist, but he had sort of, he was kind of a Renaissance man and had some interest in, uh, in archaeology. He was particularly, Hart was a, a Brazilian specialist, and that's where he spent most of his efforts, but he did do some archaeology down there. So Hamil uh, 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 Frank Cushing uh, uh, came in and was, uh, he started asking Hart, there's this, there's this kind of uh, a secondhand account of their interaction in 1874. This second-hand account, um, Cushing's uh, first-hand account isn't quite this colorful, but I'll, I'll let you know about it because it's kind of interesting. Uh, that he started to ask Hart about um, Indian sites in the locality, and Hart uh, allegedly said in this, in this probably embellished account, he said, there are no, no Indian artifacts, no sites here. And uh, Cushing said, do you want to bet? Um, and he went out. Uh, and sort of was running around uh, in Ithaca for a couple of hours and he came back with a bag of artifacts and uh, dumped them out on Hart's desk and said, see there, I told you so. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and so 
There are probably elements of that story that are embellished, but what my colleague Fred Bleach, who just spoke at the History Center a couple of days ago, uh, uh, has, has found out is that he found these six artifacts in the anthropology collections at Cornell. Uh, they all look to be local forms of stone, um, and uh, what Bleach has made the case, he did some, you know, this, this took some pretty serious sleuthing too. He made the case that these are the ones that, uh, that Cushing actually found on that day in 1874, and there are some archaic looking uh, broken points within that, within that collection. Uh, he probably went out, at least uh, um, uh, Cushing's first-hand account said that he went to Buttermilk Canyon to go find these, uh, these artifacts. Um, and so that may be where there was some, uh, some archaic period settlement. What's particularly ironic about these is that the way that they were documented in the Cornell collections is that they were cataloged as being Brazilian stone tools. <laughs> so that's why, uh, that's why uh, Bleach had to do a little sleuthing to find them, but I'm pretty sure that he's right. So as you can see, I think uh, uh, my predecessors, uh, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists of all sorts, needed to do a little bit better job with the paperwork. One instance where there has been a systematic survey was done by uh, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Levine, who was uh, working at Ithaca College at the time. She did, over a few different summers, took some students out in the Trumansburg area uh, and did some surveys, basically went through and looked in uh, cloud, uh, cloud farm fields. Uh, and they found a whole bunch of sites uh, you know, in these, uh, in, these in Trumansburg, Gigantic, Glenwood, and Little Creek area, um, and including some, uh, some points that were diagnostic of both the early archaic, which is pretty hard to find in this area, and as well as the late archaic. And I have a feeling if we did this over the whole county, we'd have you know, you know, hundreds of uh, archaic period sites. Uh, but that's just an example of when you actually try and do this systematically. This is another example where it's written up in ways that you can, uh, you can get to it. It's uh, nicely presented. We know where those artifacts are. There are field notes. Uh, we can get to the artifacts. So this is sort of a, a, a different sort of example. You will note that it's not an Ithaca, though. It's in sort of from, a, a, from an outlying area where there's um, been much less development. Here's another example of archaeology done right. Um, this was, I guess I should mention, that uh, Dr. Levine's project, this was an academic project. She said, I want to figure out what, you know, she was actually said, let's go find some archaic sites and see where they are and look what, how people were laying, using the landscape and that sort of thing. Uh, so she went out and found them. Uh, there are also, of course, federal and state regulations that in some case mandate that archaeology takes place particularly when there's development that's going to happen when uh, either an institution that receives a whole bunch of federal funds or a permit, like Cornell, for example. So when Cornell was putting in the new athletic fields on Game Farm Road, uh, the public archaeology facility at Binghamton University was contracted to do a survey in that area. And they went out and did surface surveys when it had been freshly plowed, and they found a few concentration of artifacts and did some additional excavation. And what they found out there was it looks like there were two very, very briefly used um, campsites. Uh, and they even thought that they maybe have been single-use campsites, probably from people who were traveling up and down Cascadilla Creek to sort of stop and, uh, uh, and camp out there. Uh, but there are some diagnostic forms there uh, of early woodland sites. Uh, so this is a very uh, a diagnostic early woodland uh, type of point. And some of the other stuff that they, uh, that they recovered is much more sort of prosaic looking. Probably some of that is just really like, oh, it's just rocks, isn't it? You know, but uh, <laughs> but uh, archaeologists, this is basically the byproducts of making stone tools are not very, uh, not very flashy looking, but you can, uh, a trained archaeologist can recognize them. So these are sort of just, you know, sort of quick work on stone tools uh, um, uh, that was done out there in the early woodland uh, period. So this is something that was done for compliance. Uh, they wanted to make sure uh, that no substantial archaeological resources were destroyed before the game, uh, the, the playing fields went in. Um, and again, we have field notes, we have photographs, we can get to these artifacts if we want to. So this is what uh, artifact, this is what archaeology done right is. Again, it's out on the margins, right, where, there's, where there hasn't been much development, at least to date. This is another sort of ambiguous and kind of sad um, example uh, dating to the middle, middle woodland period. Uh, in William Ritchie's book titled The Archaeology of New York State, he said there was a stone smoking pipe uh, that was found in a burial mound uh, on the Cornell campus uh, and, that, uh, and that it was in the collections of the Rochester Museum. 
Uh, so I wrote to the Rochester Museum and a colleague there found the pipe after some effort. It wasn't where it was supposed to be. Uh, and, uh, and took some photographs for me. It's, uh, it's a, not a local form of uh, stone. Uh, this is and this is right in that in that period of, uh, of mound building, um, and uh, so Richie said it was found on the Cornell campus. Um, the, the accession notes at the Rochester Museum said that it was um, it was uh, these artifacts were sold to the Rochester Museum by someone named W. Fullhart, F-U-L-L-H-A-R-T, in January 1938. Um, sorry. Uh, um, so this is, there, there were also another group from, uh, from the Mid-Atlantic uh, called the Tudelos who, uh, who settled in what is now Tudelo Park, um, south, of, south of Ithaca. This was another one of those groups uh, that was displaced and sort of came under uh, huge protection, uh, probably in the 1750s. Thanks for having I'll, I'll, I'll adjust that the next time I give the, uh, give the presentation. So based on the accounts, this is, um, uh, as most of you know, the American Salt and Clinton Expedition came through this area uh, and also through Seneca Territory. Uh, it was a scorched earth campaign. The idea was that they were going to uh, basically destroy um, all Cuban and Seneca villages that they came across. Uh, and the Americans also uh, uh, destroyed all stored food, cut down um, uh, maize that were, and other crops that were growing in the fields and burned them. Uh, the Hugas and Senecas at this time had adopted peach and apple orchards, and the Americans went through and uh, cut them all down, girded them down, and burned them. So it was basically, um, uh, you know, like Sherman's march to the sea. This was the idea that they were going to just completely destroy all the habitation and resources. They came through in, uh, in late summer uh, when there was no time to plant another crop or get anything out. There was, it was timed for maximum destruction. There were fairly few battlefield casualties. On either side, uh, the Haudenosaunee basically realized that they were not going to have much of a chance against this big uh, American force. Uh, so that they, when, when the Americans got close, basically the Haudenosaunee would uh, would flee. Uh, in some cases, the Americans found fires still burning, food still hot on uh, on uh, um, uh, over uh, over over uh, uh, cooking fires. Um, and there are quite a few documentary accounts uh, from this uh, from this. Expedition, and so you can sort of get a sense of at least the the towns that uh, that the Americans destroyed at that time. You can see there was quite a bit of uh, uh, activity. This is Cory Organel. This was the Tudelo town uh, south of Ithaca. They also talked about a few straggling Tudelo dwellings that were not being let into the uh, flats of Ithaca. They talked about the town and its suburbs, um, and. Uh, uh, not too much activity in the lower part of the lake and not quite a bit more at the, at the north end of the lake, which is consistent with sort of that model I gave you uh, at the beginning. Question. Yes. But prior to the, their coming north and attacking the Indians, you say people were frightened to come to that part of the country. Had the Indians attacked the whites that did come? No, but I think it was something where it was just, you know, that they were they were uh, way out of their elements. Um, most of those, uh, most of the groups that came through were attempting to convert uh, native people to Christianity, uh, and uh, uh, and and sometimes they didn't they didn't get a particularly good reception for that. But that was but they weren't killed. No, um, uh, in this area, occasionally you have uh, um, you know Jesuits were martyred, particularly in the 1600s. Uh, but but uh, uh, no, I, I think they all knew those stories. Uh, but it was it was a risky endeavor that they were going on. Uh, you know, some of the uh, particularly when you're going, you know, when you're going to go and try and convert someone's deeply held religious beliefs, it would, you know, it wasn't a popular thing among the, among their native hosts. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, in terms of the archaeology, uh, there have been quite a few archaeologists who've looked for the Medina Sony site that is burned by Sullivan Clinton. Uh, they're pretty hard to find, uh, despite the documentary sources that seem to indicate where they are. When you get down, when you sort of get boots on the ground to try and find exactly where these uh, sites are located, uh, they're, they're pretty difficult. Um, Dr. Bauer, who's in the audience, uh, did a survey around Fort Organelle uh, and uh, found probable agricultural fields. But is it fair to say that you didn't find, I guess, architecture? No, because we know. Um from documents from the 19th century uh, where homeowners were talking about uh, burials and a lot of Indian tools for, uh, and material from that time period, but all of it at that point was on the property of Mancini construction. 
and we were denied access mm -hmm. to that okay. property. And it's high ground, so it's, uh, in terms of the landscape, that's where we thought the village was, mm -hmm. and we knew we'd be, all we could work, be working on was the uh, farm fields. And so the property where we believe the village is, based on these 19th century accounts, is now owned by Ithaca Beer, but it's not any area that they're using right now. And so I talked to the owner of that, and they said, if we want to develop that, we'll get in touch with you. So they know and we know where it probably is. And so this is another example of archaeology done right. We have the notes, we have the reports that we can access the collections. I guess probably that 19th century stuff where they were talking about the artifacts, that's all gone, right? You know, that there's no surviving collections. Right. Except that. one of the homeowners uh, in the uh, 1980s wanted to put in a swimming pool, and as they started digging, they found a flex burial and uh, burial goods, and he covered it over immediately, told the construction people to move the swimming pool, and he said he didn't take anything out. It's still on the property that abuts the uh, the highest ground of, uh, I guess it's the highest ground of Ithaca Beer, it's on Fiddler Road. And mm -hmm. we've talked to George France, who was the town planner, and I've talked to the current property owners, and they're not doing any excavation here with that burial of the stone. So again, so here's here's something where we have archaeology that's uh, that's uh, that's 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 done right, and it's more conclusive, although right? maybe not. Maybe not. Um, you know, we don't have the site and the, uh, you know, and the, and the uh, uh, you know, the, the architecture and the, and the tools and many of the, the implements of daily life. So that sort of, but at least this is has a much better chance of, uh, you know, of uh, either being preserved or being excavated, uh, being investigated properly rather than uh, uh, than some of the other things that I've talked about here. After Sullivan Clinton, I think it's worth saying that he was returned uh, to this area. They mostly, uh, well, uh, to, the, to their territories, they mostly stayed, um, you know, most of the settlements were at the north end of the lake, and that's where uh, people returned after 1779. Uh, they, uh, the New York State and the federal government established the Cuba Reservation up there, and then they continually chipped away at it. The uh, original reservation was that whole sort of, uh, I guess, kind of vaguely triangle-shaped here. In 1795, New York State reduced the territory to six square miles. Uh, basically, they uh, uh, approached some of the Cubans that were living there about acquiring some of this territory. They said no, so they went to Cubans who were living in what is now Buffalo and said, hey, can we have some of that land that's by Cuba Lake? And they said, uh, okay. Um, and so that they would just find, uh, New York State basically would find whoever they want. Uh, they would keep asking until they found someone who said yes. Uh, similarly, they purchased uh, the two tracts that were left, and so in 1795 they were left with uh, a, a small parcel of Canoga, uh, an area around Great Gully, and what was called a mine reservation. Uh, they, they took these two in 1807, and they got that last one at Canoga in 1841. Um, all of these were uh, contravened fed, uh, federal law at the time that said you had to have a federal representative uh, at any uh, negotiation uh, that involved Indian land, none of these did, um, and uh, so and there's been ongoing litigation, as many of you are aware, about these sorts of sorts of things. What's interesting is that there are continued reports of Cubans in the Ithaca area, some of the early settlement narratives um, uh, and some of the early surveys that were done uh, of this area before it was sort of parceled out uh, and made into uh, lots for settlement. Uh, so that there was a, a, supposed to be a winter camp in Fall Creek um, uh, of Cuyugas in the 1790s. Um, uh, that that uh, what I've been able to track down about that, and there's not much. That it may have been in the Wells Falls area. Um, uh, so there were definitely Cuyugas at least spending the winter down here. Uh, surveyors found a sugaring, a, a, a Cuyugas sugaring camp right there. And then uh, in the early years of settlement, there was actually a group of Oneidas who were led by a guy named Chief Wheelock who settled over in the Brooklyndale area. Um, uh, so really what I think you start to see is that the Cugas, uh, um, really uh, many of them felt that these were, uh, justi were unjustified and that they continued to use their homeland in a way that they had, uh, that they had beforehand. But it got to be more and more difficult to do that when white settlers uh, started to come in and, uh, um, and adjust the landscape and everything like that. 
So I'm going to leave you uh, with one, uh, with one um, ambiguous note that's also from the Samuel Parker ma uh, manuscript. He was talking, uh, this is, follows right after he talked about the Parker Street, uh, the Parker Street Cemetery. Um, apparently his father, who was the doctor, did take many of the human remains that were unearthed and he reburied them. Uh, Parker said it was actually uh, uh, right where Seneca Street is today. And I have a feeling that even if they've been there for a while, that they aren't there anymore just due to things like road construction and utilities and sewers and that sort of thing. Uh, so um, so it, uh, Dr. Parker, I think, was at least trying to be respectful as the other people were carrying the kettles off to their kitchens. Uh, but young Samuel Parker uh, said, another spot for such graves was on the bluff or height south of Six Mile Creek where the brick white house now stands. The house built by, and, that, and apparently he was, he, this was a manuscript, uh, he intended to go back and sort of fill in some of the details, but just leave asterisks, and that's how the manuscript left, was left at the time that he died, just west of the continuation of Aurora Street up South Hill, and extending to the site of the McGraw House on the rise of ground south of the head of Tioga Street. So we have extensive cemeteries, that's a pretty serious amount of territory if you look at the maps. The White House obviously is still there. The McGraw House is quite visible on some of these historic maps here. It sounds like it was a big zone where there were a lot of people buried um, uh, um, uh, at the very uh, north end of South Hill. Uh, so that implies we don't know how old they were. Um, we don't know whether they were used over uh, a decade, a hundred years, several thousand years, but it seems this indicates that there were a lot more indigenous people living in Ithaca than even the scanty picture that I've given you so far. Um, and then he continues, also on the new removed knoll just south of Fall Creek, which is Fall Creek's long, right? Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, but, it, but what we're really looking, uh, you know, both not, not only on South Hill, but also in sort of, uh, in the Fall Creek area. So we have cemeteries in many different places, so this suggests that there's a lot more going on here. And unfortunately, it's all been destroyed and you didn't say a thing about what types of things were recovered in these different places. Um, uh, and so, and then he even continues, doubtless nearly the whole of these moraine knolls of the former levels of Hugh Floyd contain more or less of these graves. So he's got lots of other areas that he identified as being zones of indigenous inhabitants, but this is something you know. Uh, I don't. There, is there anything to trace? I, you know, I think that's that maybe that may be absolutely all that we've got. But, but um, just I I've tried. To, believe me, I googled full heart um, and uh, looked in the phone book and uh, no no traces. Um, and again, we know that they, they could have been found in 1938, or he could have had them. You know, that it could have been the first constructions at Cornell uh, in the 1860s uh, that his family could have gotten this pipe and then he only decided, they only decided to unload it uh, in the 30s. Um, you know, so again, we can't just go back and let's say, where was Cornell building in 1938 and that's where it was from. Um, that might be, uh, it's certainly a possibility, but, uh, but again, we, we can't really tell. Um, and again, you, you, what, what you do start to see is the very, very cavalier treatment of burial grounds. Uh, by the settlers, uh, washing them away, um, digging into them uh, to get the artifacts. Um, and in many, most of the instances, uh, the skeletal remains are no longer with the artifacts. Um, it's, uh, and this is certainly something that Native people have uh, protested back and forth. Uh, but uh, our predecessors as settlers of Ithaca apparently didn't see anything wrong with it. I imagine if you do a simple mirror test, if you could imagine how they would have responded had Indians sort of gone and said, we're going to dig up, uh, you know, the cemetery on uh, on University Avenue. We're just going to go in there. We're we're curious to see how early Ithacans lived. You know, how Ithacans would have felt about that, right? So that you could see that there was a, a real sort of blindness, a double standard, a real sort of ethnocentric idea that it was perfectly okay to go dig up uh, uh, and desecrate Indian graves, uh, um, even despite the, uh, the 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 clear wishes of the indigenous popular, uh, population. We start to move a little bit farther up in time, uh, and this is uh, this is the Parker Street site. This is the one that was exposed, at least in part, uh, when they were diverting the water uh, to go uh, to form Seneca Street. Uh, I found the initial description uh, in Glen uh, in Glen Norris uh, in Old Indian Trails. 
Um, and he mentioned a manuscript uh, uh, by Samuel Parker that I mentioned before uh, that was written in around 1895. Uh, it's in the Cornell archives. I went there and I took a look at it. Uh, and he describes the site in some detail. There are some things about his descriptions that are really weird and I can't, uh, and I'm not sure how to make it out. Uh, there's some things that don't really sound very much like uh, Indian sites in this period, uh, but there's enough to make me think uh, that, there, that, uh, that there certainly was a site there. He said it was pretty much all, of, all along Parker Street, uh, and there were a lot of people buried there. That there were, I think he's, he talks about there being at least 50 graves that were, uh, that were opened up uh, and, uh, and destroyed in the 1830s uh, along Parker Street in that, in that gravel knoll. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, I think if you've got 50 people uh, in a you know, cemetery, that you had a pretty good number of people that were living uh, probably in that, in that general area as well. He describes copper-based kettles with what, uh, which uh, that's got to be uh, European trade goods, so we're dealing with sort of the post-1500 uh, period. Um, uh, and he talks about them uh, having a heavy iron band around their tops. And this is ambiguous. Uh, there are forms of kettles. These are actually diagnostic of, uh, of Basque. Uh, Basque people made uh, uh, copper kettles like this that had uh, these, this, you know, most of it is copper, in fact, pretty close to pure copper, but they did have these iron attachments around the very outside like that. So is that what he's talking about? Uh, or there are other forms of kettle that have really sort of an iron wire inside the rim and they fold the copper over the, or brass over the top of it. So is that what he was talking about? If, uh, if it's these Basque forms, they were only used from about 1560 to 1625. Um, uh, and it would be really unusual. He, it sounded like there were quite a few of them, uh, according to what Parker said. That would be very, very unusual for that time period. Um, Parker also said that a lot of uh, early Ithacans, most of them were broken, either from pressure of the ground. Some of them may have been intentionally sort of broken at the time of burial. Uh, some of the Ithacans, when, uh, when these burials started to be unearthed, they saw these, ca these uh, copper kettles and they said, uh, oh, that, that looks pretty good. I'm gonna, I'll take that and have the copper smith down the street fix it. And so he, he said that many of these sort of made their way into Ithaca kitchens from the graves uh, into, uh, uh, to, you know, to prepare uh, uh, the early settlers' foods. He also said remnants of knives. Uh, you can have stone knives I, uh, or iron knives. Uh, given that he didn't say very much about it, I have a feeling he meant that there were iron knives. Uh, so that's another thing uh, that, uh, that seems to suggest it's a post-1500 site. He said there were flexed burials, and there were also uh, burials where the bones had been rearranged, uh, so sort of it was something where they had been buried once and then, uh, and then, uh, and then dug up and rearranged. Uh, that's actually not very common in the Hodinsoni uh, area, uh, but there are groups from Ontario who do that with, did that with some regularity. Uh, so it's possible that we had a group of refugee people from Ontario that settled in this particular area. Uh, maybe as early as between 1560 and 1625, uh, but we'll never know. Uh, that because uh, that other than Parker's description, there's no other notes, uh, there's no art, surviving artifacts, no nothing. So we just know that there's a post, uh, you know, post Columbus site uh, on Parker Street, presumably a village somewhere near in the area, but that's, that's all we've got. Norris provided a brief description of a site on North Geneva Street in, uh, in the Indian Trails book. Um, and the way he described it, he said it was near a stream, probably a fishing location, uh, and didn't say anything else about it. And I looked at that and I said, oh, that's probably archaic. That sounds like an archaic site to me. And that was, uh, that was really where I had to leave it. But I was going through the paper files in that room the other day, and I found a typescript that had been put together by William Elliot Griffiths, uh, and he actually did sort of a point-by-point -point inventory of what had been found at that exact exact site in uh, 1901 when there was uh, some residential construction going on there. There was a grave uh, found there, uh, and he said that there were three brass kettles of nested sizes. Uh, what he described, some of this stuff is weird too. I don't, I don't know what he's, he's talking about exactly. I don't know what the twisting process is. I'm not sure. Uh, how the stone and arrowheads, uh, you know, stone and arrowheads. I don't know, were there some brass ones or something? Uh, or, or were there big ones? 
uh, and uh, you know, so some of this phrasing is fairly, uh, fairly ambiguous, but we definitely can tell that this is a post-Columbian site. Uh, one of the things that was very uh, interesting to me when I read this, as I said, this is my sort of era of specialization, when he said that there were wampum discs that were found there. And in fact, he said a little bit more about those, and he said that there were three of the discs that were, quote, ornamented with the symbol of the six ellipses or emblems of the six nations uh, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, <coughs> and they were strung together so as to lie flat on the brass. Um, and I have seen some of these artifacts that look exactly look, uh, like this. This is a drawing of one, not, not these ones. We have no idea where any of the stuff from North Geneva Street ended up, but it's pretty clearly one of these. Okay, This was a drawing that was made by uh, William Henry Holmes in 1883, uh, and this is an archaeologically recovered example uh, that's in a museum collection. But you can see uh, the ellipses, the, 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 you know, the six sort of uh, leaves here, and you can imagine it's pretty easy to see why Griffiths would have uh, assumed that that was related to the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, what uh, my colleague Dwayne Essery has done, he studied this, uh, this uh, form quite extensively. He's actually surveyed a um, huge number of museum collections, and what he has found that this type of what's known as a disc runty, and there in fact, um, uh, they have drilled out, two drilled out holes that go crossways like this, so they are designed to be suspended to lie flat when they're suspended exactly the way that, uh, that he describes them. <laughs> These uh, disc runtees, all of them are only found between 1645 and 1710, and the six-petal arc rosette, which is what es Essary calls this particular form, actually is uh, used only in a very, very narrow period of time, 40 years we can narrow that down to, so that we can know, based on Griffiths' description, that that site on North Geneva Street, uh, single burial, but there may, you know, there may have been more, um, there presumably would have been a village associated with that, uh, that that was in use between 1670 and 1710. And what's pretty interesting about this is there is absolutely no um, documentary source that says there was any, any Indian activity in this area, uh, you know, in, in sort of the 1560 to 1625 period, and also during 17, 1670 to 1710. This is something that wouldn't be known, uh, uh, known otherwise, uh, except for that one piece of paper that I found in the room, uh, the room over there. You do start to get some documentary sources. Uh, Norris actually uh, digested a number of them in this book that's called Early Explorers and Travelers in Tompkins County. I think this one's out of print. Uh, Rod, I don't know whether, we, whether we're going to have to revisit that, <laughs> about whether it's, this is going to be useful. Um, Norris, in some cases, um, uh, used a little wishful thinking um, to say that Etienne Brule came through this area in 1615. Uh, um, I, think, uh, I think he really would like that to have been the case, but uh, there's not enough information in Brule's original document to really nail down the idea that he came through this particular area. So, um, uh, so I'm not sure that that's, uh, and there's no description of what he encountered when he traveled through here. We know that he ended up, uh, that he started out somewhere in Pennsylvania and he ended up with the Onondagas in Syracuse. So yeah, he probably came somewhere near here, but we have no description of it and we don't know uh, the exact route. Uh, Norris uh, says that there were Jesuits who were stationed uh, with Cayugas at the north end of the lake in the 1650s through the 1680s. He said that they probably visited uh, the Ithaca area, but we have absolutely no documentation that that's true either. Um, there are some Moravian accounts, and the Moravians are great. They, they wrote very, very detailed descriptions of their travels through central New York. Uh, we know that, um, uh, and Norris, I think, makes a very good case that there were British and Moravian travelers in the Dryden and Caroline area in a few different, uh, few different time periods, but it's also the case that they didn't come over here, that their trail went over in that direction, uh, over towards the Syracuse area, and they had no reason to come through here. The one place where you can definitely see, um, uh, uh, um, get a, an eyewitness account in these documentary sources were uh, two uh, Moravians, Johann Kammerhoff and David Zeisberger came through this area in 1750, and they uh, uh, encountered some Cayugas uh, very definitely on the shore of Cayuga Lake, uh, and they were fishing there, and uh, the Cayugas served uh, the Moravians turtle eggs and dried eel uh, that, they, that they've been harvesting uh, uh, at the lakeside. 
So was there a village nearby, or had they traveled from the known Cuba settlements up on the north end of the lake? It's hard to say. Uh, the eel was American eel. We find those on archaeological sites, and they're sort of a, uh, you know, a migratory species that was part of their life in the Atlantic Ocean and would travel up the St. Lawrence and go into the lakes. They don't come here anymore because of all the, the dams and other uh, forms of, uh, of, um, uh, of water control. Uh, but they would they would migrate in some numbers, and uh, uh, Indian people knew when they'd be coming through, and they'd be able to sort of camp out and harvest a great number of, uh, of eels. Moravians also came through in 1766, and they visited a, a small uh, village uh, um, at the at the southeast end of Cayuga Lake. And what's interesting is this was uh, said to be a Delaware town. Um, the Haudenosaunee, especially in the 1750s uh, onwards, 1740s onwards. Uh, would bring in other groups of uh, people who had been displaced uh, from their homelands by European colonialism, and they'd allow them to settle uh, sort of under their protection, uh, um, and the Delawares were probably in that, uh, in that um, um, category. It's also, the documents also su suggest that there was a Saponi community, which is a, a, a group from the Mid-Atlantic who originally had their homelands in the North Carolina and Virginia area, uh, Pony Hollow, uh, nearby, uh, near here, uh, it has been identified as the location of a Saponi community uh, uh, by the documentary sources. It's also important to note here that it, th these are really, this is it, right? This is the documentary record. And, the, and it's not that there were tons of Europeans up here who never wrote anything down. This was really Cuban territory, uh, uh, even at these relatively late dates. The Europeans came through here. Uh, very, uh, they were few, their visits were few and far between, and you can see from the accounts here uh, that they were pretty well scared to death most of the time when they traveled through here. This was uh, not a place that they felt comfortable. This is not where Europeans uh, had control by 